This is the Permaculture Podcast. I'm Scott Mann. Over more than a decade, the Permaculture Podcast has explored the landscape-based practices which lead to permanent agriculture, as well as the invisible structures necessary as individuals and in our community to create permanent culture. Today's episode examines our ability to create culture and continues the 12th anniversary celebration of the Permaculture Podcast as Alistair Stewart joins me to share his insights on how media and culture influence the community and countries we live in and how those stories shape who we are and our experiences. Through those lenses, Alistair and I look at representation in media, the importance of inclusion and diversity as creators and consumers of fictional works, the value of cultivating kindness, and changing outlooks on mental health. We also share how we find hope through storytelling, on the page or through the screen, as we face an uncertain future, and invite you to find your own hope and join us on that journey. If you're not familiar with Alistair, he's the co-owner of Escape Artists Incorporated, which produces the wonderful short fiction podcasts Cast of Wonders, Escape Pod, Podcastle, and Pseudopod. Alistair is also the regular host of Pseudopod, where he not only introduces the author, narrator, and fright to follow, but also shares his commentary and critique on the story for each episode and how that unique tale fits into our lives and world. As you might imagine, when a pair of media-loving folks who grew up immersed in comic books, TV shows, movies, and games of all kinds come together to talk about how those works create our society and a vision for the future, it leads to nearly continuous references to the personal and pop culture that shaped us and that we see as continuing to mold current generations. If you love anything like Doctor Who, Terry Pratchett, TikTok, Henry Rollins, Heavy Metal, or George Carlin, you'll find we refer to each of those and so much more somewhere in today's interview. Enjoy this time with Alistair Stewart, and I'll join you again after. I was born on the Isle of Man, which is a very small rock halfway between England and Ireland. And that gave me two very strong things, a tremendous sense of the need to make my own fun and a slightly different perspective, which has carried me pretty much all the way through life. My training is in English and history, specifically in critical analysis of both. And very early on during my time at university, what became really apparent to me is I love to write. And because I am the son of a teacher and a nurse, my first instinct is always to make sure people are okay. And my second instinct is always to recommend a movie to them and explain why they'll like it. So all of that together led me down a couple of paths. My first job out of university was I was a comic store manager. I was there for a very long time, about close to a decade. And this was at the point where the small and indie press in the UK connected to the internet was really taking off. So I was very active as a critic in that kind of field. And I did a certain amount of small press fiction as well. And over time, that led me to transition across to tabletop RPG writing. And then not long after that, I plugged a 56K modem into a wall and painstakingly downloaded a 20-minute episode of a new horror show called Pseudopod, which was a thing called a podcast. And downloading that took about as long as it took to listen to the episode. And that changed my life. 15 years later, I host the show. I co-own the company. And my partner in the company and in all things is someone I met through the show. So now I find myself co-owning a multiple award-winning and multiple award-nominated podcast fiction organization and running an email pop culture newsletter, which has just over a thousand readers. I've also co-created a couple of RPGs and I'm also a voice actor. So that whole making my own fun thing, I think has actually worked out quite well. I certainly believe that it has. As a child of the 80s and a teenager or an adolescent of the 90s, I had many similar experiences. And it was through my love of short stories and podcasts that I discovered you and your work, particularly Pseudopod. It's been a wonderful experience to hear your critiques of fiction and the way that fiction and our interaction with that 
type of media, whether it is a movie or a play or now that we have podcasting and so many people can share their voices, that these are ways for us not only to communicate very complicated ideas through story, but also ways that we can critique our society or explore aspects of it that we might not engage with in our political discourse or other ideas. And it was hearing your voice on Pseudopod is why I wanted to have you join me today is to share some of your thoughts and ideas from those experiences and the impact and value of fiction and fictional storytelling. With that bit of a preamble, is there any particular aspect of it you would like to explore in this moment that we can use to take the conversation from here? I think the the one thing that really leaps to mind is that the idea of diversity and inclusion, because that seems to be something which is very much at the front of the laughably manufactured culture war that we all find ourselves mired inside. And it's something which increasingly informs everything I do as a creator and everything I do as a consumer of culture as well. When I was younger, I loved a police procedural show called Third Watch. And it still holds up, actually. It's a John Wells show. He'd go on to do the later years of the West Wing from this. And Third Watch was about a uniform division of the New York Police Department and the firefighters and paramedics who worked out of the same building as them. And I have never, ever forgotten a piece of, not even advice, but a question a friend of mine at the time asked me about a particular episode of the show, because we watched it together. And I'm quite enthusiastic. It's probably coming across already. I was talking about how much I enjoyed it. And I looked me straight in the eyes and I said, would it have been more interesting if the main character for that story was a woman? And that knocked me on my ass because the answer was yes. And that has become one of my guiding principles. Is this story more interesting? Is it more unusual? Is it more relevant? Is it more resonant if you change the lead character? And the default for the lead character is almost always a cis-hat white guy. And the obvious kind of knee-jerk bounce back to that is, well, what about the cishet white guys? To which, as a cishet college-educated white man, I say, we're actually doing quite well. I think we can perhaps help level the playing field a little bit. And for me, stories which are inclusive, stories which are diverse, are always more fun. They're always more interesting. They're always more reassuring. And I think a lot of that comes from my childhood, from growing up on a predominantly white, predominantly Caucasian, geographically very isolated community. And there were really two ways to go, and everyone goes through both of them. The first one is everywhere else is not to be trusted. I was born there. My parents arrived two years before I was born. They lived there for 22 years. I know people who still refer to them as comeovers because you couldn't trace their lineage back onto the 14th generation. Seeing different voices, seeing different perspectives, speaks both to my need to have my own very different perspective acknowledged. And it also speaks, like I say, to this fundamental idea of reassurance. Jumping to a slightly different track for this. I, for a very long time, didn't get on terribly well with Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, and it took me a really long time to figure out why. It's because I was bored. There is almost no point in almost any Arnold Schwarzenegger movie where you can genuinely, truly believe he's in danger. Because a man is carved from oak, even now. He is this colossal, iconic figure. And he's done all these action movies, and a lot of these were were coming out when I was a kid, growing up. And I would watch them and go, that was really cool, that was great. In the case of the two Terminator movies, they're the exception to the whole lack of danger thing. But never for a second did I find myself worried for him and it's because he is one of the kind of embodiments of the ideal he's a a capital p protagonist in all of his stuff he's wearing what's called plot armor and some of that is his physical presence and some of that is the fact that he was obviously a star he was someone who was larger than the project he was in and every time i see someone who's gay or someone who's on the lgbtqia plus spectrum in any way or someone who's a different body shape or a different height, or someone who has less hair, or someone who's a different ethnicity, any type of different identity. It reassures me on two levels. Anytime I encounter this in fiction, 
And the first is that it reassures me I'm not still trapped on a small rock in the middle of the Irish Sea, surrounded by a lot of other people who want off about as badly as I am. And also that there are other people out there being seen, because there's almost nothing more powerful than being seen in fiction. Having that moment where you look at a character and go, they're just like me. And that's empowering and reassuring and kind. And it's taken so long for us to get to just the tiniest iota of that, which we have now. And I'm always happy to see it. From the place that you sit, what is the best way for this kind of representation to occur? How can we, for those of us who are creators and are interested in including those kinds of characters in our works or elevating those voices, what do you think are some of the best ways that we can do that? I'll throw another reference out because I used this in a, in a meeting at work today. There is a moment in one of the Wallace and Gromit movies where Gromit, the super genius dog, is pursuing the evil penguin that has been robbing banks because it's that type of a show. It's a really lovely little series. And this is all taking place in a chase between locomotives, which are model trains. And Gromit is frantically laying down the railway for the model train he's on as it's hurtling along. And I think to some extent, with a lot of popular culture in particular, that's what we've spent the last decade or so doing. We've become aware of the fact that there is this colossal failure in representation. And we've been frantically laying track in front of us going, this probably isn't going to work, but it's a good start. Let's just do that. And I think now we're starting to get to the point where there's a bit more track ahead of us. So we can move from the kind of triaged phase to the, how do we go about doing this? And I mentioned that because the most obvious piece of advice I've heard and been told and given most often when asked about how do you produce an inclusive and diverse and welcoming story, is the old chestnut of try, screw up, try again. And that's one of those truisms, which is really unusual because it's true. And it's also simultaneously helpful and not helpful at all. Because on the one hand, yeah, no one's going to get it right first time. And it is difficult. And you're probably eventually going to upset someone. And that's going to mean that you have to listen and take on board criticism and work around it as best you can. And for the longest time, that was the one step that we had. Now we have two or three. From my experience, you always have to carry that idea that you are not going to get it right first time with you and always be open to feedback. There's a phrase I find myself using an awful lot when I'm in conversations that is just, thank you, I appreciate the steer. Because you have to be super aware of the expectation of extra emotional labor. If you find yourself in a position where you're going, this isn't going to work, but the folks who I'm writing about are going to show up and tell me I'm wrong and explain how, and then I'll fix it, and they'll become my friends. What you're actually doing is asking a group of people who have had almost no representation for as long as they can remember to sand down and varnish the representation you're giving them, and then thank you for not doing quite a good enough job. And that's not right, which leads us to step two. There is a very kind of hot button phrase certainly over here there's been a couple of attempts to loudly criticize this and, and n none of them have made any degree of sense which is the idea of, of sensitivity readers and sensitivity reading is the type of emotional labor wherein it's expected and as a result there isn't that confrontational element to it i'll give you an example there's a project i'm working on at the moment which at some point further down the line is going to have a member of the Catawba nation as a recurrent character and we haven't rolled her out yet because, honestly, we need to make a couple of contacts with the Catawba podcasting community, run the scripts past them. This isn't an EA thing, by the way. This is something which I'm consulting on for, for someone else. Can run the scripts by them and basically go, can we pay you for your time to take a look at this and see if it works? And if it doesn't, to help us get it to work. And you find sensitivity readers everywhere now which is amazing there are folks who sensitivity read for people of color there are folks who sensitivity read for every element of the lgbtqia plus spectrum there are folks who sensitivity read for religion for culture for all of these things and the criticism that's so often leveled at this is that this gets in the way and all the uncomfortable corners get knocked off it stories just become homogenized and different and when I hear that criticism, I'm almost very tempted to ask the person who's criticizing it whether hypersleep was comfortable and if they dreamed, because it's just demonstrably false. The simple act of having diverse, interesting, different types of people in your story makes your story diverse and interesting. 
And this whole thing of, oh, the author can't speak truth under power. No, the author just can't do whatever the hell they want. It's this moment that the industry as a whole seems to be going through where certain strands of it are being asked to politely sit at the grown-ups table when they're looking for some pudding to fling. And it's really tiring because it's not an issue. It's like every other element of that. It's people picking a fight over something which is demonstrably sensible. If I'm writing a story about a character who's a person of size, as I am, assuming I wasn't a person of size, the first thing I would do is I'd find someone whose sensitivity reads for folks who are shorter or taller or bigger than most people and run it past them and say, could you possibly take a look at this for me? And I will, of course, pay you for your time. And yeah, it's time consuming. And yeah, certainly raised in certain groups, as many of us have been, it's a little annoying. But here's the thing. It never fails to make stories better. It never fails to widen your audience. And we are told as authors endlessly and justifiably that we have to do everything we can to speak to as large an audience as we possibly can. So when you get told that you need to make sure that the people you're writing about are happy with this and you have a dialogue with them and this is going to help edit and revise and make the story better, you shouldn't throw your toys out of the prayer. You should thank them. With representation, I think of a number of series that were very helpful for people to read at certain periods in their lives, that they were formative stories. In my life, it was the horror of H.P. Lovecraft. When I was reading Lovecraft as a child and getting anything that I could get my hands on, I wasn't aware of his racism. Or I think recently there's stories of a boy wizard that was... Oh. incredibly helpful for people and yeah. made them feel like part of a bigger world and like they were seen. This is a conversation I have with my wife all the time, who's a huge fan of those stories. And with those kinds of formative stories that we may find out later, or the author may move into a position that we don't agree with, do you still find power and value in the stories and the art themselves? And that question of being able to separate the art from the author. Yes, but it's work. The best example I can give you is one I draw from personal experience. I was a lonely kid. I was functionally an only child. I have an older sister, but she's 10 years older than I am. And she mostly moved out by the time I developed language skills and the ability to move. And I was tall, early, big, early. Basically, from the moment I hit adolescence, my weight parted between about two and 300 pounds and never quite shifted. And growing up in the 80s and 90s, I was part of one of a legion of groups of people for whom there was nothing in terms of representation. If you were the fat kid, you were chunk in the Goonies. Or if you were the fat kid, you were usually the bully. Or you were usually the butt of someone's jokes. And I can very distinctly remember seeing Ghostbusters for the first time, which was a couple of years after it came out of the cinema, I think on Betamax video cassette, and I am dating myself hilariously by doing that. And I remember watching it, and I remember seeing Egon Spengler for the first time, and I remember the back of my brain going, oh, thank God, it's not just me. And at the same time, as I watched it, and I saw Bill Murray's work as Ventman, the back of my brain went, thank God, it's not just me. Because when you're big and clever, two things happen. You have to either steer into the big or you have to steer into the clever. And I very much chose the clever. Sarcasm was very much my left hand for a very long time. I was a noxious child. But I had my reasons, like we all do, because we're all obnoxious children. I loved Ventman. Loved him to tiny pieces. Venky was who I wanted to be when I grew up. And Remember, this was at the same time as the real Ghostbusters cartoon where Lorenzo Music voiced him. So there was quite a lot of Venkman stuff to go around. And then about five, six years ago, we watched it. And Venkman is one step off an episode of To Catch a Predator. Throughout, Venkman is an active and enthusiastic sex pest, especially in the first one. And that was very hard to watch. And ultimately, at the same time, it was very vindicating. Because I realize I'm not 15 anymore. 
And from the point of view of a 38-year-old dude, I was able to enjoy this classic movie and at the same time go, this was extremely made in the 1980s. And also still greatly enjoy spending time with Egon, who was a tall guy who was very much in his own mind a lot, like me. And also realized that fundamentally, I'd actually got it wrong twice. And in reality, the Ghostbuster that I most commonly identify with is Ray, because he's big and he's kind and he's hard to kill. So I think what that comes down to is there's always worth in revisiting this stuff. But you have to be okay with the fact that you're going to be revisiting it on your terms. And those terms are going to change. There's a thing I talk about an awful lot in the newsletter, which is the idea that art is defined by the time in which it is created and also the time in which it is encountered. And Ghostbusters is a very good example of that for me. When I was a kid, I loved it. When I was an adult, I still loved it, but I could see the joints. And the simple fact of realizing that did an immense job, an immensely helpful job of making me realize I was grown and changing as a person and doing so for the better. That we can still enjoy that material for the impact or to revisit it as something that was meaningful to us or has become a classic while also recognizing or accepting that aspects of its creation or the people who were involved were or are problematic. Absolutely. I read Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card very late, about a decade ago. Loved it. I never need to read it again. And I went into it knowing very well what his horrifying views are. And that made it a very different experience, it made it a very sad one, because he doesn't live anything resembling the values that Ender finds at the end of that novel. And it's a real shame, because I know that book helped a lot of people. And I'm really sorry it didn't help its author. I have friends who speak of Ender's Game in that series and how much it meant to them, but I didn't discover it until after I had read some of the things that Orson Scott Card wrote beyond his fiction and so couldn't clear my headspace enough to go back and read it and be able to appreciate it in the way that they did. Exactly. And it is one of the great tragedies and one of the great joys of interacting with modern culture that it's always different when you do it. And I think I ended up coming to Ender's Game in a slightly different direction to you. And I was aware of some, if not all, of the stuff, and I came to it very cautiously as a result. I was fully prepared to put it down the second he started to misbehave in the book. And of course, it's a terrible thing about Ender's Game. He doesn't misbehave in that. The author he is in that book is the author he is now. But for Ender's Game, at least, there was the chance that he was going to be one of the best versions of himself, and that is not what we got. And then I think of the work of someone like the late Terry Pratchett that reading his material that was written decades ago were incredibly inclusive across class lines and character arcs, and he made it funny. It reminds me, actually, I'm playing a really good video game at the moment. I'm playing a thing called Dark Side Detective by a company called Spooky Door, and it's a kind of deliberately old-school, point-and-click, pixelated adventure. You play a police officer who deals with all the weird stuff in your town, and there is an episode of The Haunted Library, and... When you eventually work out how to see the ghosts, you find out that Lovecraft and Poe are having a slap fight over who wrote the scariest book. And Enid Blyton's talking to this kid who's accidentally summoned all the ghosts. And Mary Shelley would really quite like to stand further away from the live electrical wires, thank you. And it's very good. It's very funny. And there's this location you go through where there's a chess game being played. And there's no one around, but the pieces are just moving. And when you work out how to see the ghosts, you go back through there. And the game is being played between Pratchett and Douglas Adams. And every other author you can talk to, every other author has a kind of quest behind them. And with Pratchett and Adams, all they have done is you click on the dialogue option, and for Adams, the cop says, I loved your Dirk Gently books. And for Pratchett, the cop goes, wow, big fan, thank you. And it is one of the kindest, gentlest ways to honor a couple of beloved authors I've ever seen. It's so classily done. And I really enjoyed encountering that. You remind me when I was playing through the Shadowrun trilogy of RPGs that Mike Pond Smith of Cyberpunk fame has a cameo in the first oh, game. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, <laughs> and Steve Jackson is in there as well. Oh, that, that's brilliant. I love that. The other side of this conversation that I was thinking about when I asked you to join me on the show was about how fiction and stories and storytelling can prepare us for what could come. 
And initially this thought arose from reading Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower mm -hmm. and knowing how influential that book was on so many people on reimagining culture in a world falling apart. Or recently in the environmentalist circles is Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry of the Future. Oh, I was hoping seeing... you'd bring that up. Yes. It's such a utopian story of how to handle this big picture problem and what the future could look like. I was hoping if you could comment on either of those novels in particular, or if you wanted to speak more generally to the impact of narratives on our ability to understand and change our thought processes in the face of these kinds of existential or unknown or unknowable futures. I'm going to cheat and try and do both. There's a really interesting interview with Stan Robinson where he talks quite a lot about how that particular book is his job now and how he's taught it for, I think, two and a half years. And the audience for it just keeps building and it just it keeps finding new relevance and new ways to go and new people to interact with. And I think that is incredibly helpful. We all have a lot more to deal with than we had two years ago. And without going all the way down, down some of the darker paths, we have war in Europe. We have, I think, two and a half pandemics at this point. I know monkeypox is heading towards that. And there's at least one other that seems to have taken its sweatsuit off and is doing knee bends on the sidelines, unfortunately, and also escalating climate change. We are maybe three weeks in the UK off our first ever 40 degree days and they were murderous and every day that has gone after that has been high 20s it's been 30 plus this is celsius for the last three or four days and we live in an apartment which has windows on one side and that that side is west facing so it becomes somewhat uninhabitable in here for about half the day there's a lot on we all have an awful lot that we're trying to deal with and we all have an awful lot which it feels rightly because they aren't no particular support structure in the Western world is especially minded to help out with. I'll give you an example from, from life. Gas prices in this country, heating gas, are going to break every ceiling very soon. The government regulator whose job it is to ensure that the prices are affordable has essentially been hobbled. And we're looking at heating bills crossing £5,000 a year by early next year. One of the more pessimistic responses. Also, we are currently trapped in the middle of a leadership campaign for a party who have parked in power for 12 years. I swear up and down that everything that's gone wrong is the fault of the people who haven't been in power for 12 years. And are most of the way through their barely 200,000 member electorate deciding on their fourth leader since their last election victory. There is, like I say, a lot. And I think that's one of the reasons why Stanley Robinson's book is finding such traction because what we're starting to see and this is something which i think the pandemic has inspired especially through the great resignation is an awful lot of people have decided to take control of their own story because they've realized that no one else will and you're starting to see a lot of grassroots examples of that and i think the presence of that book as it continues to resonate is a very good example of it. I think newfound fondness and audience for Station Eleven, which is extraordinarily good, is another very good example of it. Also, the escalating amount of fiction you're seeing directly addressing climate change and directly addressing the concept of doomism. This is something which I've bounced off a couple of times. The idea of doomism is we're screwed. It's all done. The best we can do now is survive. And I have friends who push back very hard against them. My friend Rick Worth is a very good example. Rick, amazingly, is another former comic retailer like me. Same story. Even. And he's now a very good comic creator. He wrote a superb series called Hocus Pocus about the history of magic. And he worked in a book called The Most Important Comic Book on Earth, which is this huge telephone directory-sized tome, which directly addresses climate change, directly addresses what we can do about it. And the idea that individual choices and individual decisions and small-scale projects when you stitch them together matter and that's getting lost and i think it's now very slowly starting to get lost less 
there's a fondness for nihilism in the Western world, especially. The everything's going to be on fire in 20 years, so we may as well have another cookie. I'm always there for the other cookie, but I think we should maybe do something about the fire as well. And you're seeing very small steps towards empowering and educating audiences. And I'm belligerently hopeful as a human being, just in general. And I'm very belligerently hopeful about genre fiction's role in directly addressing and empowering people to do something about climate change. And I think that particular book is a very important part of that. And I think Station Eleven is too. Are there any other examples in the media that you would point people to stories or movies or television shows that you enjoy that give you hope for the uncertainty ahead? Oh, yeah. I'm going to absolutely embrace the stereotype here and uh, invoke Doctor Who. If you grew up in England in the last 50 years, you were a Doctor Who kid. And like all faiths, there are many schools within Doctor Who. And it's very fashionable at the moment to dump on the most recent incarnation. And it's always very fashionable to do it in exactly the same way, which is it's not that I hate that the Doctor is a woman now. It's just that I don't like the writing. And I don't doubt that for a lot of people, that's absolutely the case. I also don't doubt that for a lot of other people, that's a very convenient thing to say. I have been very fond of this run in particular because it speaks to the two things I found myself steering more and more towards as a creative across the last few years, and those are kindness and hope. This doctor is belligerently optimistic and very imperfect and completely without filter. And I think those are all very admirable qualities. And also, they've directly addressed climate change a couple of times. One episode, I think all from 55, regularly makes the worst episode ever list, which Anytime that happens, my response is always the same, which is watch more of it and wait. It's seriously, I never, never do this myself, but many years ago, I was a film reviewer for a, for a website for a magazine over here called SFX, and I reviewed the Wolverine movie. And I quite liked it. There's some quite fun stuff in the Wolverine movie. And because SFX were masochists, they left the comments open and all the stuff on their website. So literally the first comment on this is someone going, it's the worst film I've ever seen. And the second comment is someone else going, see more films. And it's just, it is the most perfect, inescapable nuclear put down. I just, I love that so very much. But yeah, there's, I think Doctor Who has a lot of stuff in it, which speaks to the type of mindset, which I think is going to become something we all find ourselves looking at, which is, yeah, this is awful. And yeah, there's awful things which we're going to have to do, but we're going to do them and it's not all going to be awful. Growing up in the U.S. during the 80s, we had four television stations. One of them was usually some form of public broadcasting that would re-air Doctor Who and Red Dwarf. Oh, and, the classics. Yes. What was it? All Creatures Great and Small. Yeah. And so, like, I grew up watching the early Doctor Who through that, and then my kid's big sister, my stepdaughter at the time, we started watching Doctor Who together when they restarted with Christopher Eccleston. Mm -hmm. And so we watched a lot of those together. And I'm now rewatching the new incarnation of Doctor Who from Eccleston forward with my son, because he's mm -hmm. really getting into sci-fi at 12. And I don't remember if it was Eccleston or Tenet's Doctor that one of them, there's a line that's something like, I'm the one who shows up because... I will stand alone against the darkness. Yeah. And there's a lot of hope in that kind of a statement for any one of us that we can show up and make a difference by being there. Oh, yeah. And over the years, the show has explored that in so many fascinating ways. I'm very fond of Eccleston. I think he has the best dismount in the show's history. And I think an awful lot of the stuff in his run is the blueprint for what we've had since. Just as Once Everyone Lives is not just a high point for the series, I think it's a high point for UK drama. Because the more you think about it, the more you realize is that you have this person who is riddled with PTSD, who has seen and done countless horrible things, and just once it's going to work. And his just feral joy in that is so moving. And you see it with all of them, Tenant is another one I relate to an awful lot. He talks too fast and he thinks too much. That hits me straight between the eyes. Smith's incarnation is a really interesting character. I didn't like a sizable chunk of it. I watched all of it because I couldn't take my eyes off him. Capaldi, to me, 
is one of the all-time greats, but that's precisely because it's like watching a heron in a leather jacket realize that everything around him smells bad. He just has this beautiful, persistent, slow burn revulsion, and underneath it, so much emotional complexity. I vastly enjoyed his entire run, and I vastly enjoyed 13 too. Jodie Whittaker is another Northern Doctor, and she has the same kind of mindset as a lot of the people I grew up with did. Try your best, help when you can, keep moving. An awful lot of fandom is awful. But the show itself is this just blueprint of how to be good, how to be a good person, and how it's all right when you're not. And I think a lot of the positive elements of British culture and all the positive elements of fan culture, and those are two groups which need all the positive elements they can get some days come directly from that show. You make me think of all the times that the doctor across incarnations was in a place to do something devastatingly terrible or to lose their Gallifreyan humanity. And because they had someone there to hold them, it held them back from being the worst they could be. My partner spotted something that speaks very strongly to that a few years ago. It's one of the, the promo images for the season the Tenth Doctor has with Donna. And how the first time you look at it, you could see that it looks like he's putting himself between her and harm. And then you look closer and her hand isn't in his hand, it's on his arm. And what she's doing is grounding him and telling him to step away. And he doesn't want to, and he's doing it anyway. And that exploration of anger and negative emotions, especially the male presenting geeks, I'm fairly certain saved lives. Because especially on this side of the Atlantic, we are literally conditioned to believe that emotions will get us killed in war. Years ago, one of my best friends and her husband went to see Stardust, the adaptation of the Neil Gaiman novel. And it ends beautifully. This is a spoiler for my 15-year-old movie. The two main characters, when they die, turn into stars and, and spend the rest of eternity in the, the sky near each other. And she's sitting there and tears are running down her face. And it's all really sweet. And her husband, who's very literal by nature, goes, yeah, but they're at least two light years apart. And she nearly tore a chair out of the, 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 of the ground and beat him with it. And to see the evolution of the willingness to engage with emotion in geek culture move from that to how many times who has dealt with death and loss and mental illness and trauma and has done so in a way which has been open-hearted and big and kind and flawed and it's just kept trying is incredible to see and such a relief. You and I are within a couple of years of each other and my parents were very much about a dignity approach that we don't express our emotions, we do the best we can, we help the people around us, but if we're having a problem internally, that we find a way to deal with it so that we can keep being present and keep showing up. But I look at that and I go, how healthy is that approach rather than engaging in the conversations and having the place to express these ideas and to be able to have the hard conversations that may lead to tears? Exactly. The thing which it put me in mind of, strangely, is TikTok. TikTok, I am finding, is the exception to the rule. It is a social network that does not want to become sentient and kill us all. For something which started as, I believe, a pair of lip sync apps badly glued together by venture capitalist money, there is a lot of really good stuff on TikTok. There's a lot of advocacy. There's a lot of very good comedy. The comedy writers of the next generation work in three-minute chunks, and they're all absolutely on point. And it is the only network I've ever seen that talks as openly and as eloquently as it does about mental and emotional health. And a huge amount of stuff I've seen on there is about how it's sometimes you're not okay and that's all right. And a lot of the time it's couched in comedic terms. There's a sound because you can sample sounds on TikTok that gets used an awful lot, which is someone going very well. Today, we're going to put on our big person pants and we're going to do the hard thing. And then when we've done the hard thing, we will have a small cry in the chocolates to make us feel better. Huzzah! 
and just it's full of stuff like that it's full of this acknowledgement that life at the moment is much harder than it used to be in the near past and that's not good but that's not everything and we're okay and that is an incredibly powerful social tool and frankly it's one that mark zuckerberg can invent in his wildest fever dreams and the fact that we have it is i think very much a good thing now you have me thinking of all of the subcultures and subgenres and the art that emerged from them. And one of the things that I miss the most is with the implosion of the steampunk community here in the United States. All of the interesting creativity that came out of that, and especially like a lot of the music that were these deep parodies of British empire and colonialism and making it through that dark night of the soul to the next day. It was the music in that scene that I really enjoyed and I'm a huge metalhead. And people are like, how can you listen to something like that? What do you get out of it with some of the themes that metal artists will explore? And it's, this is stuff that takes me to my happy place. Absolutely. Um as I am, largely because of Henry Rollins. When I was 17, I had a very high-end trauma. I lost someone far too young, and they had leukemia three times in three years. And the third time, they chose not to receive chemotherapy. So myself and the rest of his circle of friends found ourselves at one of the most important times of our life, basically trying very hard to keep it together whilst we were literally waiting for a friend of ours to die. And on top of all of that, I attended the same school as my father taught in. The adolescence motorcycle was revving its engine and just screaming for, to, to be let go. And I had the worst haircut of my young life. It was not a good time. And in and amongst all this, I picked up a copy of The Box Life, which is a two cassette spoken word series by Henry Rollins, the then lead singer of Black Flag. Rollins changed my life. He was the guy whose work talked about emotion and talked about how to process it. And a lot of the time at that point in his life, he didn't process it at all. He just talked about it and how it was possible to be both big and clever. And that was the light at the end of the tunnel for me. I just started walking towards that and I never stopped. I totally understand the whole idea that metal can be a music of relaxation, of vindication, of joy. There's a couple of Rollins band tracks that I put on every time I need to get shit done. In the modern context, there's the idea that comes from Stoicism. And I'm sure that I will misremember what exactly it's called, but it is like the contemplation of evil. And for me, I grew up listening to my father's George Carlin records when I was far too young. <laughs> so I think I was nine years old when my parents gave me my first record player. And I was pulling out my dad's Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath records, falling in love with music, and interspersed in there was George Carlin. And I put one on, and my dad hears the swearing coming from my room and throws the door open. And it's like, what are you listening to? Found this record, and this guy's funny. Ah. And my father encouraged me to keep listening. And he's like, this is how adults speak. I just don't want to hear you use this language, but there's no reason to keep you from it. That's incredible. And then when I was 14, my father took me and one of my close friends to see Carlin live. Oh, wow. And George Carlin is who I fell in love with language because of. Yeah. But hearing someone who had such a sharp view of the world and the way that he could play with language in order to criticize it. And yeah, just the impact that kind of a performer can have, which I think cycles through a large part of our conversation today is not just about the stories and the storytellers, but all of these different ways that art can change our perception and our lives and the way that we can make a difference. And your mention of Rollins and yeah, just your mention of him, he wasn't something that came to mind. But he is one of those men who, he's big, he lifts, he was in a band that was super famous. And as a rock star through his public persona over the last 30 years, is a great example of someone who pushes back against some of those toxic elements. 
Absolutely. I've never forgotten an interview with the Rollins band. I think when they toured their last album and someone asked what was on the right that they had. And I think their bass is absolutely deadpan with everyone else has like Jack Daniels and blow. We have fruit and nuts and occasionally cheese. I think what I love so much about Escape Artists Incorporated and all the different shows that you've produced over the years and them being largely focused on short stories is that someone can find something that they're likely going to enjoy that can make a difference for their journey and their lives through a piece of fiction. That is always the intent. When we took over the company, my my workshop, the company motto that, that we still work with, which is one story told. And that is such a broad church, but it means that we can include things which will hopefully do exactly what you say and help people feel seen or feel reassured or help people deal with elements of their life through fiction. I very often joke that I only get to listen to my own show because I have to edit it because of how much work (laughs) goes into it and everything that we have to do. But for anyone who's been a creative, I know that there are those moments where we go, is this something that I still care about? Is this something that I'm still passionate about and needing to answer that? And for me, sometimes it is throwing on a couple of episodes of Pseudopod, hearing your voice and the commentary that you have and the stories that follow because of not only the great authors that you have, but the great readers who will come on. And it reminds me of how important this kind of work is to so many people. And that as a podcaster, it can be a lonely form of creation, but to know that there are so many other amazing, talented people doing good work and knowing that as yeah, creatives, we're not alone either. It is the most wonderful thing about the field because like you say, we all come into it alone, often literally. And across this course of the last four or five years in particular, as the voice acting has started to fire up as well, what I've become much more aware of is that's absolutely not the case. That there are always listeners, there are always people who hear you, there are always people for whom your work matters. And that is an extraordinary feeling. And especially if you can internalize it, it becomes like the base note for everything that follows it. And I've never encountered that anywhere other than in podcasting. I work as an editor in the TTRPG space. And it's one of those things that I've encouraged folks and offer that if they ever want help to create a podcast, that the statistics of growing a podcast into something that is very large and worldwide, it can take time and to break through. And the most shows, if they have more than a thousand regular downloads, they're larger than 50 or 75% of the other podcasts in the world. Oh, absolutely. It can be a form of media that you engage in that is micro, but still has an outstanding outsized impact on others. Exactly. The most visceral example I had of that was working on the Magnus Archives, where in the space of a year, about six people in wildly different areas of my life who had no idea that I was a voice actor at this point. They knew I was a podcaster. They didn't know I was doing dramatic work. were listening to the Magnus Archives, and each one of them got to my first episode. And I would always know because I get this DM that was always in what capitals and always said basically the same thing, which was, I didn't know you were in this. For those people who aren't familiar with you and escape artists and your other work, where can people find you? First of all, thank you so much. This has been an absolute blast and happy anniversary. And as for where people can find me, there are probably three places it's best to go. Escapeartists.net is the core site for all of our podcasts. They're all linked through there. And there's full details on what we do. Each site also has its own website and you can stream episodes through those. And they're also on any podcatcher you would care to name, hopefully. I'm most commonly on Pseudopod. I do two or three episodes a month at the moment, though I do also occasionally pitch it for Escape Pod as well. The other place you can find me most commonly is Twitter, where my username is my name, Alistair Stewart, just with the at sign at the front of it. And the other big project I have at the moment is the pop culture newsletter that Marguerite edits and I write called The Full Lid. Now, publishes weekly. We're actually in our sixth year. 
and we're a finalist for best fanzine at the Hugo's this year. And what you get with that every week, it's free. It's not one of those kind of paid tier situations. What you get every week is at 5 p.m. British Standard Time on Friday, you'll get an issue which will have two stories in it, a bunch of interesting interstitial pieces, and just bits and pieces about what we've been up to that week. The two stories are most commonly either a piece of creative nonfiction or a couple of reviews. To give you an example, as I'm writing this, the next issue looks like it's going to have a review of the just incredibly good new Predator movie, Prey, starring Amber Midthunder, and also a review of an excellent new comic called Golden Rage, the elevator pitch for which is absolutely lovely, and it's Lord of the Flies meets the Golden Girls. And it's actually somehow even better than you might think. So that goes live Friday at 5 p.m. And you can sign up to the full lid through my website, which is alistairstewart.com. Or there's a whole bunch of promo tweets that go out through my account, which will give you everything you need to know. And also MailChimp holds the last six months worth of it. So when you click through that, you'll find the archive and you'll find a bunch of good stuff to read. For folks who are listening to this in the first few weeks after release, this will be... About eight weeks after the release of that issue with Prey, so you'll be able to find that there in the MailChimp back catalog. And definitely go check it out because Prey was an incredible representative movie. So good. I think that I like Prey a little bit more than the original. I'm right there with you. I'm very fond of Predator, and Mm -hmm. I'm quite fond of Predator 2 still. Also, it should be said, and this is not a spoiler, it is just a simple statement of fact, Prey has perhaps the best dog in movies this year. Absolutely. There's a really good dog in Prey. That Carolina dog was a very good boy. Absolutely. (laughs) And then as I like to close every conversation, do you have any final thoughts for the listeners? Yeah, there's something which I've been working really hard on because it's being the type of person I am, this is something I have to expend a lot of effort on. And what I refer to as our increasingly precedented times have really thrown this into sharp relief. I think if I had a single piece of advice, it would be this. You're probably not being as kind to yourself as you think you are. Because there are so many pressures and so many requirements on your time and your attention and your rage a lot of the time. It's really easy to feel like you exist in the perpetual state of righteous fury and you have to show up for every fight and you don't if you do that you'll die it will kill you and that will do anyone any good least of all you so when you find an opportunity to be kind to yourself take it the most obvious example i can give you is i had a long period last year where i had a mild health concern that's now been addressed but one of the flip sides to all of this was i had to take some medication for a little while which meant I got dehydrated very easily. I I took this medication very seriously. I took staying hydrated, not remotely seriously. And I can tell you that it took the second time I was in bed for two days with the shakes and vomiting to go, you know what, perhaps I should be drinking more water. And it is something as simple as that. Drink more water. Go outside if you can once a day. Make sure you have things in your life that bring you joy because joy is not the carrot at the end of the stick. Joy is not the thing you get at the end of the week if you've been good. Joy is fuel. Joy and enthusiasm are the things which get us through the day, not just for things we do, but things others do. Be nicer to yourself. And that was Alistair Stewart. Find him and sign up for the Full Lid newsletter at alistairstewart.com, Escape Artists Incorporated, and their amazing slate of podcasts are at escapeartists.net. I'd also like to give a big thank you to the artist Sarah Hawk for allowing me to use the drawing of Alistair in a She-Hulk t-shirt as the cover image for this episode. Their commissions are open, and you can find them on Twitter at Sarah Hawk, S-E-R-H-A-W-K-E. You'll find links to all of those and Alistair's social media accounts in the show notes. I enjoyed this conversation with Alistair because of how he points to the ways media, in whatever form it might take, from TV shows to spoken word albums to podcasts, can have an impact on us as individuals and help us develop or change our worldviews. How media, as a shared expression, can create a culture or subculture where we feel at home and want to be an active participant in. That media can create a cultural zeitgeist that changes a country 
or the world. As permaculture practitioners, we can share our vision of the future and by doing so show others what is possible. As we share the stories of our lives and experiences through podcasts or memoir, we link the past to the present and this work of telling stories that resonate from our voice, body, and bones is vital to the work that permaculture has and holds now and for future generations. If you have a story inside of you, find a way to tell it however you can. Your voice and message matters. If there's any way I can help you with this path, get in touch. If you're a patron or follow me on Twitter at PermaculturePod or Instagram at PermaculturePodcast, feel free to drop me a DM. You can also send me an email by using the contact form at thepermaculturepodcast.com. While you're there, spend some time checking out the archives of the show, which stretch back to 2011, many of which you cannot find anywhere else. Before closing this episode, I'd like to give a hearty thanks to Alistair for joining me, as this conversation was a special one. I've dreamed of interviewing him for years after hearing his voice, both his literal spoken voice, and voice as an expression for his point of view and talent as a writer, many, many years ago when I downloaded my first episode of Pseudopod. It's been a pleasure to have this experience and chat with him like we're old friends. I continue to tune into Pseudopod and remain a dedicated listener because I am inspired by Alistair's message that we can shine a light into the darkness and find hope, even when we face real monsters in the world. That hope, along with a story well told, remind me that we are not alone, that there are others like us in the world, and we can stand together with them, whatever comes in the days, years, and decades ahead. Until the next time, listen to an episode of Pseudopod while you spend each day discovering the media that inspires you while creating a culture that takes care of Earth, yourself, and each other. <laughs>